Do you want to talk about the toxicity of plutonium, Arnie Gunderson? Um, I think you could better do that, but it's a, a very dangerous substance <laughs> named after the god of hell. Yeah, well, you know, it said a, a millionth of a gram will give you cancer if you inhale it, but in fact when they injected plutonium into beagle dogs way back in the Manhattan Project, they didn't find a dose low enough that didn't give all the dogs cancer, which was probably 10 to the minus 9 grams um, picogram amounts, incredibly tiny amounts. Um, and plutonium's interesting. It's it's not absorbed from the gut generally in food except um, in the neonatal gut because it's immature. And also it's more readily absorbed in chlorinated water. And much of our water is now chlorinated. It, it, it gets into the body mainly, though, through inhalation, through tiny particles entering the lung, where it can induce lung cancer. But then it's an, it's an interesting material. It's transferred by white blood cells called macrophages that eat it into the lymph glands in the centre of the chest. They're called mediastinal lymph glands, where it can mutate regulatory genes in cells to cause lymphomas. Um, it it, it is also an interesting material because the body thinks it's iron. It's an iron analogue. So it combines with the iron transporting protein called ferritin. And as such, it's transported and deposited in the liver, where there's a lot of iron, where it can induce liver cancer, to the bone where haemoglobin is made in the red blood cells, where it can cause bone cancer or leukaemia or multiple myeloma. It uh, has a predilection for testicles, and every male in the Northern Hemisphere has a tiny load of plutonium in his testicles from the weapons testing days, and the stuff's still falling down from the sky. Um, and it tends to deposit just next to the spermatogonia, the, the cells that are the precursors of the sperm, where it can induce mutations like for cystic fibrosis or for for, for hemochromatosis or diabetes or whatever you name it and those mutations then can be passed on generation to generation meanwhile the plutonium because it's got a half-life of 24,400 years and lasts for quarter to half a million years lives on and if the man's cremated the smoke goes out the chimney so another man can inhale it and it could get into his testicles and induce similar mutations so you could see uh, plutonium can cause an exponential increase in deleterious genetic diseases down the time track. The other thing plutonium does, oh, it lodges in the ovary as well, where it can do the same thing to genes in, in the eggs, but it also crosses the placenta. Now, the placenta lets nothing through. It's a very, very selective organ, but plutonium does get through because the body thinks it's iron, uh, where it can lodge in a chromosomally genetically normal embryo and kill a cell that's going to form the left half of the brain or the right arm and that's called teratogenesis and that's what that drug thalidomide did when pregnant women took it to alleviate morning sickness and their babies were born with gross deformities I had a man who drove a, uh, a bobcat on my land and he had no arms he just had legs and he ran a radio station with his toes and he was a thalidomide baby. Um, the other very important thing for people to know about plutonium is it, each reactor manufactures at 500 pounds of it a year, and you only need 5 to 10 pounds to make a bomb. And as it lasts so long, any country with a reactor has a, an unlimited bomb factory for the rest of time. So kind of that rounds up plutonium. Do you have anything else to add, Arnie Gunderson? Well, no, they've detected it as far as 100 kilometers away, um, and um, uh, I'm in, sure it went further. In Japan? Further, but in Japan, it's been detected 100 kilometers away from the reactor. Now, isn't there some study that's been done recently, Yanni, um, that's detected plutonium um, hotspots falling out in Seattle and elsewhere? There's hot particles that have definitely been detected in Seattle. Um, whether they're plutonium or not is, uh, is, is unknown at the time, but they are um, physically highly radioactive particles that, uh, that sell out both on Tokyo, um, Japan in general, but also as far away as Seattle. Now, there's a study coming out on Monday, October 31, 
and it's by the um, American Public Health Association, and it's a peer-reviewed paper. Um, the person who's written it is uh, Marco Caltafan at uh, Worcester Polytechnic, and he determined that um, uh, in Seattle, uh, individuals were exposed to about five hot particles a day if they led a sedentary lifestyle. Really? Perhaps as high as 10 hot particles a day if they were, um, you know, physically active joggers and stuff really? like that. Really? Five to ten a day? Over what yes, period of time? That's all of April. All of April. And hot particles, when you say hot particles, do they measure the sort of radiation coming out? Alpha, beta, gamma, what was it? Uh, it that will be presented in the paper, and I don't have the, the details oh. on that. Uh, the process was that they had a filter, and the pump that pulled, 10 cubic meters a day through the filter, and then every day they change the filter so that um, um, almost like a cigarette filter. And then they would roll the cigarette filter out and examine it with a scanning electron microscope, and they would find these hot particles. Oh. So um, they also found that um, uh, the same study that will be released in, on October 31 um, also found that in the Cascades, there was as much as 300 um, becquerels per kilogram of cesium-134 and 137 deposited on the soil. And that's the Portland, Oregon area. Um, and also, there's an awful lot of data in, uh, in Japan as well. Uh, car air filters uh, were highly radioactive, and also children's shoes were highly radioactive. Now, all those details will come out in the paper and it's going to be on the um, APHA, uh, American Public Health Association, website. When? It'll be out November 1. Uh-huh. Okay, so people could, should keep their eyes open for this. So as we talk, Arnie Gunderson, it, it seems to me that really the, the truth about the Fukushima accident is only filtering out in small aliquots all the time. But but the overall picture seems to be one of an absolute total disaster where there's a cover-up by the Japanese government, by the International Atomic Energy Agency, by TEPCO, by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, by the American government, about just how obscenely dangerous... This accident has been, is, and will be. Would, would you like to comment on that statement, Arnie Gunderson? I've been dealing with a lot of reporters in Japan, and um, Tokyo Electric has an enormous influence on the, uh, the government of Japan. Um, I think uh, one of the reasons for the accident uh, um, that it hasn't been paid for uh, is that the government of Japan is afraid to... Uh, drive Tokyo Electric into bankruptcy. But one way to get money to pay for a quicker cleanup would be to sell Tokyo Electric and use that cash to uh, um, to clean up Japan. And that doesn't seem to be on anybody's agenda. So clearly within Japan, there has been um, you know, a hand-in-glove relationship between Tokyo Electric and the government. I I've said before that you know the, the priority of Tokyo Electric was save Tokyo Electric, then maybe save the Japanese government, and if there were anything left, save the people of Japan. And I think that priority of the Japanese government was one, save the government, two, save TEPCO, and if there was anything left, save the people of Japan. So I think that um, you know, the people of Japan have been at the bottom of both priorities for both the government and Tokyo Electric. I would agree with you, too, here in the States, um, the accident is being uh, minimized by both the uh, regulators, the government, and, uh, and obviously the nuclear reactor vendors. That's obscene. I can't think of any other word to say but obscene. Uh, you know, as I look at the study from the New York Academy of Sciences on Chernobyl and compare what the Russian government did in its haste and concern, it took a while, 10 days, to get going, but it did get going, and compare that with the Japanese government... What they've done, the comparisons are quite startling. Would would you say that, Arnie? I, I actually think it's it's worse because the population density in Japan is much higher than the population density in that part of of Europe. So, 
Yes, the Russians acted after after the bureaucracy became aware of the magnitude of the problem. They got people out and kept people out. Mm. Um, but there weren't as many people to move. Now, here's the Japanese who uh, have more people and didn't move them. So uh, I'm really concerned about the long-term health effects of, uh, of the people uh, of northern Japan. Yes, well, there are 300,000 children still in Fukushima Prefecture, two-thirds of whom are going to school and living in areas where the Russians would have evacuated uh, people already. And I know Japan's a crowded island and there are millions of people. There are, what, 30 million people in Tokyo or 50 million or something. But they could have, they could have evacuated those children who are so innately radiosensitive to southern parts of Japan um, that they... They they just should have done it, and the and the thought that you can clean it up is a misnomer. You can't clean up radiation. Look, you can get bulldozers and you can bury some stuff, and then it'll come up again in the plants and in the food and with rain and wind and everything. Lots of the areas in Fukushima Prefecture are mountainous. They're wooded, um, and as you've pointed out to me on numerous occasions, Arnie Gunderson, when it you know, they might clean up a little village by bulldozing it and stu- stuffing the, the stuff in a, in a trench or something, but then when it rains, down comes more radiation and, and the water brings it down from the hills and the like. Do you want to talk about clean-up, per se? Uh, yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you that the children should have been moved out in the first couple of days. And I was on television here in the United States on CNN saying just that, you know, but women... Childbearing age women, pregnant women, and children should have been moved out immediately. And, you know, we have the example of during the Blitz back in the 1940s, what did the English do? They moved their children out. Mm. Um, So it's not unheard of that a population would go out of their way to protect the children. And um, I think the Japanese um, uh, missed the the opportunity and are continuing to miss the opportunity. These... um, Uh, the, the, the photographs we've got of the, uh, the, the children's shoes in the Fukushima prefecture show that they're just loaded with cesium. And, uh, you know, the shoelaces, and the kids get it on their hands, and then they get it in their throats. Oh, God, oh, my on and on. It's, a, it's a major concern to me is the, the, the damage they're doing to, well, the, uh, to the children of and, Fukushima. And the other thing is that nuclear accidents never end. I don't think people understand that, that apart from the fact that this thing is almost incurable and will go on for years and years and years emitting radio- radiation, and if there are more earthquakes, God help everyone. But that the stuff that's already landed on the soil, cesium, strontium, we can go on and on, tellurium, neptunium, curium, and the like, stays there for hundreds of years, hundreds of years, So, and it, and it concentrates in the food. So people are eating radioactive food, when the cesium gets into their bodies, that stays in their bodies for a long period of time, years sometimes, um, irradiating just very small volumes of cells. So those cells continue to get a high dose. The people get a high dose. Um, they're still eating radioactive food. They will then die of their cancers or whatever they die of or heart disease or diabetes and many things can be caused by radiation. And then... The next generation will be born probably exposed in utero to the radioactive poisons because their mothers are eating radioactive food, drinking radioactive milk. And then it goes on and, and, and cesium lasts for 600 years. Therefore, there are three generations per century. So you could say 18 generations will be exposed to, just to cesium-137 itself. And, and it's important to note also that 40% of Europe is still radioactive from Chernobyl. What, what, what really staggers me, Arnie, as a paediatrician, I, I guess, is that this is so irreversible. And what, once it happens, it's, it's happened. There's nothing anyone can do about it. 